Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast covers population genetics. I talk about genotypes and phenotypes, inheritance patterns, and the Hardy-Weinberg equation. I also discuss the ways a population's genetics can change over time, like through genetic drift, mutation, gene flow, and selection. This material will show up on one of the four MCAT sections, that's the bio-biochem section. I hope you find this podcast helpful in your studies, and good luck as you get ready for the MCAT. So the first thing I want to do here is define population genetics. Population genetics is the study of genetic variation within a population. Essentially, it looks at how the frequencies of genes and alleles in a population change over time. And this is in contrast to molecular genetics, which essentially looks at genetics through the perspective or through the view of a microscope, right? You're looking at mitosis and meiosis. You're looking right in at the cell at DNA repair mechanisms, transcription, translation, and so on. So population genetics essentially takes a macro look at genetics, whereas molecular genetics, which is probably what you think about when you hear the term genetics, takes a more micro look. And so I'll start this podcast with a little bit of a review of the difference between a genotype and a phenotype, and then I'll get into a few of the common inheritance patterns. And all of this is important to understand for the Hardy-Weinberg equation and some of these other concepts in population genetics. Okay, so a genotype is the particular set of alleles or genes carried by an individual at a specific locus. And if that's not clear, let me just give you an example to hopefully clarify it a little bit. So there is a particular gene called the BRCA1 gene. You've probably heard of it. It's related to breast cancer. And everyone has that gene, right? I have it, you have it, your mom, your dad, your uncle, your aunt, your friend. Everyone has that particular gene, right? That's just some locus in a chromosome. I think it's on chromosome 13 or something like that. Everyone has that. However, everyone does not have the same two alleles of this gene. And you could think about alleles as just being different versions of the gene. So, right, everybody gets two alleles. You get one from your dad, one from your mom. And together you have two copies of whatever gene that we're talking about, in this case, BRCA1. Now, together, those two alleles make up your genotype. Now, this is why I want to go back to this BRCA1 example. So, some alleles of BRCA1 are mutations that are associated with breast cancer. Essentially, this is mutation that results in the loss of function of the protein that the BRCA1 gene encodes. So this is taking a very simplistic look at genotype, but you could say, for example, that a person could have a genotype where one allele of the BRCA1 gene is mutated and the other one is normal. And so they're at an increased risk for breast cancer but not as much as someone who has two mutated alleles. So overall, if I wanted to describe the genotype of these two individuals that I just talked about as examples, I would say that the first individual is heterozygous for the BRCA1 mutation, whereas the second individual is homozygous for that BRCA1 mutation, meaning that they have two copies of the mutated allele. Okay, so that's genotype. It's also important to understand what phenotype is. So phenotype is defined as the set of observable characteristics of an individual resulting from the interaction of its genotype with the environment. So this is essentially observable or measurable characteristics that result from a genotype and also the environment. Let's talk about this in context of the BRCA1 example that I used earlier. So let's say that an organism has the genotype that I just described, the second one, that was the BRCA1 double mutations or where where the person has two alleles that are both mutated. This puts them at a higher risk for getting breast cancer, as we know, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that the person's gonna get breast cancer, right? You could have this allele, or you have these alleles, this genotype, yet you might not get cancer, right? And that just goes back to the fact that phenotypes are a combination of both the genotype and the environment. So you have to maybe meet up with a carcinogen in the environment that then is going to actually set off that breast cancer, cause it, but you know, this gene mutation renders you more susceptible to that breast cancer. So this is all to say that for the phenotype of breast cancer in the example that I'm giving, genotype and environment both contribute. So this BRCA1 example might be a little bit of a tough example to understand. So let me just summarize all this information using a simpler example. So say that hair color is only controlled by a single gene, which it's definitely not, we know that, but pretend it is. So genotype would be the two alleles for this hair color. Say that I have one for brown hair from my dad and one for blonde hair from my mom. That's my genotype. Now, let's just say that the brown allele is dominant. Well, then that would give me the phenotype of brown hair, right? That's the observable trait that people could see. Okay, so before I get into the Hardy-Weinberg equation, I want to talk about different inheritance patterns. And I've talked about this before on a previous podcast, so I'm going to just kind of review these quickly and then move on. So inheritance patterns connect genotypes and phenotypes. And there are seven of these that I want to go over, and I'll start with autosomal dominant. So first off, when we're talking about autosomal inheritance patterns, we're talking about genes that are located on non-sex chromosomes. Now, in the case of an autosomal dominant trait, you only need one allele in order to show whatever phenotype we're talking about. So, for example, let's say that we're talking about the gene for Huntington's disease. Well, Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant disease, and so all you need is one mutated allele at this one gene in order to have that disease or have that phenotype. Now, traits can also be autosomal recessive, meaning that you need two copies of a particular allele in order to show a phenotype. So an example of this is like cystic fibrosis. A person needs to inherit two mutated copies of the CFTR gene, one from each parent, in order to have the phenotype of cystic fibrosis. In addition to traits being autosomally inherited, they can also be linked to the sex chromosomes. Particularly, they can be linked to the X chromosome. So X-linked genes are genes that are present on the X chromosome, but not the Y chromosome, and obviously none of the other 23 chromosomes. And these X-linked genes have different inheritance patterns in comparison to autosomal traits because the X chromosome is present at different copy numbers depending upon whether we're looking at females or males. For females, the inheritance pattern is very similar to an autosomal trait, right? They have two X chromosomes. So if a trait is X-linked dominant, they only need to possess one X chromosome with that allele in order to show the particular phenotype that that allele elicits. If a trait is X-linked recessive, and we're talking about a female, then the female must possess two of these alleles that lead to whatever phenotype we're talking about in order for that particular phenotype to be shown. Now for males, this is a little bit different because males only possess a single X chromosome. So essentially, whatever X chromosome they inherit from their mother, whatever allele that has on it, that's the phenotype that they're going to express. So even if a specific allele is recessive, a male will only have one copy of that gene, and so that recessive allele is going to elicit its phenotype. The next inheritance pattern I want to talk about is called mitochondrial inheritance. And essentially, it goes back to the fact that we inherit our mother's mitochondrial DNA. If you don't know, mitochondria have their own DNA, sits in the mitochondrial matrix. To me, that's pretty damn interesting. I mean, why do mitochondria have their own DNA? They're the only organelle that has its own DNA. And they're also the only organelle that reproduces via binary fission, just like bacteria. And so, of course, there's this theory called the endosymbiotic theory that says that a bacteria at some point was engulfed by a cell and that bacteria became a mitochondria. Is that true? Probably, maybe, we'll never know. But anyways, 
back to mitochondrial inheritance patterns. These are actually pretty easy to pick up on because whatever phenotype the mother expresses, that's the phenotype that the children of the mother are going to express. So say that the mother has some type of mitochondrial disorder. Well, there's one in particular called Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy, which leads to the loss of vision in both eyes. And as I said, this results from mutations in mitochondrial DNA. And so a mother will pass on this disorder to each of her children. And the daughters of that mother will then pass on this mutation to their children and so on and so forth. Now, the sixth and next inheritance pattern I want to talk about is called genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is an epigenetic phenomena that causes genes to be expressed in a parent of origin manner. So as you know, and as I've talked about, we have two alleles at a specific gene, right? We have one from our mother, one from our father. However, in genomic imprinting, one of these copies or one of these alleles, either from the mother or the father, is silenced through epigenetic modifications. In other words, if the father's chromosome is imprinted, that means that the children will only express whatever allele or whatever gene is inherited from the mother. On the other hand, if the mother's chromosome is imprinted, they will express whatever allele they inherit from their father. In terms of disease, this obviously puts children more at risk for disease, right? Because if they inherit one defective or mutated copy, and let's just say that that mutation is recessive, then they're kind of protected by that other allele that they inherit from the other parent. But if that other parent's chromosome is imprinted and therefore not expressing a functional protein, then that one mutated allele can cause a diseased phenotype. Okay, now for the seventh and final inheritance pattern. And this one is a little bit more abstract, but it is complex and multifactorial inheritance. And this is how a lot of traits are inherited. So take, for example, hair color, skin color, eye color. These are all traits that have multiple inputs. You know, not only are there multiple genes that contribute to that trait, but you also have the input of environmental factors. You may have heard the term polymorphic before, so that just refers to traits that are controlled by multiple genes. This can be hundreds of genes, um, it can be a few, but polymorphic traits are an example of complex and multifactorial inheritance. Another is this BRCA1 example that I was talking about earlier. So as I said, you can inherit a mutated copy of BRCA1. However, as I also said earlier, just because you inherit a mutated copy of BRCA1 or two mutated copies, that doesn't mean that you're going to get breast cancer, right? Your risk to getting breast cancer is a lot, 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 lot higher, but there are environmental factors at play. And so that's part of what makes this trait, breast cancer, have a complex multifactorial inheritance pattern. So with some of the background out of the way, I want to next get into the Hardy-Weinberg equation. At Med School Coach, we know that studying for the MCAT exam can be challenging, especially for busy students on the go. That's why our team created MCAT Prep, the only all-encompassing study app built specifically for the MCAT. MCAT Prep by Med School Coach provides student access to extremely high-quality content and a personalized curriculum for free. The app has more than 250 videos, 1,000 flashcards, and 1,000 unique MCAT questions. Plus, MCAT Prep by Med School Coach allows students to create a personalized study schedule and track progress over time. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into medical school, and now you can put the experts from Med School Coach into your pocket. It's the closest pre-med students can come to a personal tutor without spending a penny. Download MCAT Prep by Med School Coach for free at medschoolcoach.com MCAT, or download it directly from the Apple Store or Google Play Store. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and MCAT Prep by Med School Coach can help. Okay, so you'll see population genetics come up a few places on the MCAT, one of which is the Hardy-Weinberg equation, the other of which is changes in genetic makeup of populations over time, which is what I'll get to next. But let's first get into the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So the Hardy-Weinberg equation uses allele frequencies to calculate genetic variation at the population level. 
In other words, it's a mathematical equation that can be used to calculate genetic variation of a population at equilibrium. And the first thing you should be wondering with that definition is, what do you mean by a population at equilibrium? Are there conditions that this population needs to meet in order to be at equilibrium? And the answer to that question is, of course. And there are six assumptions that the Hardy-Weinberg equation relies on in terms of a population being at equilibrium. But before I get into those, let me first tell you about how this equation came about, because it's kind of an interesting story. So it all started with the observation that without selection, allele frequencies remain relatively stable in a population. So say, for instance, a gene has two possible alleles, either A or B. And of course, this is very simplified, but that means then there can be three different genotypes. There can be AA, AB, or BB. So this observation that was made would then say that the distribution of AA, AB, and BB individuals remains relatively constant in a population over time without selection. And so this observation was introduced to an English mathematician named Godfrey Hardy during a game of cricket. And the person that actually introduced this observation or this question was a biologist named Reginald Punnett. And yes, you can probably guess that is who came up with the Punnett square. And so Punnett got Hardy thinking about these allele frequencies in a population and kind of how that worked mathematically. And then Hardy did what he called, quote, a little mathematics to derive the Hardy-Weinberg equation that we now know. And at the same time as Hardy was deriving this equation, there was also a German physician named Wilhelm Weinberg. And this physician came up with that same exact equation independently at around the same time. So they added his name to it as well to give him a little bit of credit. And now there are six assumptions that underlie this Hardy-Weinberg equation. The first is that the organisms that are being investigated with this equation must be diploid, meaning that they have two sets of chromosomes and therefore are able to have two alleles for each gene. The second assumption is that mating is random. The third assumption is that the population size for this population is very large. The fourth is that there is no migration in the population, including immigration and emigration. The fifth is that there is no natural selection. And the sixth is that there is no genetic mutation in the population. And to me, these conditions are reminiscent of physics equations, right? You're introduced with these equations for, say, free fall. And it's super cool, right? You can calculate how fast something is going to fall, the distance it travels when it's shot out of a cannon, etc. But then, of course, you're told these equations only apply in cases where there is no air resistance, gravity's constant, you're shooting a perfectly round ball, the earth doesn't rotate, etc., which are obviously not true at all, but are assumptions for the equation. And it almost makes the equation seem like it's pointless or like it's bullshit, but these equations essentially give estimates for what motion looks like. And in the same way, the Hardy-Weinberg equation gives estimates as to what the genetic makeup of a population looks like. So let's get into the Hardy-Weinberg equation. The Hardy-Weinberg equation says that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared has to equal 1. It also comes with the stipulation that P plus Q is equal to 1. And these characters, P and Q, correspond to different things. So P is the dominant allele frequency, and Q is the recessive allele frequency. And you might be wondering, okay, so what exactly is an allele frequency? Well, an allele frequency is the frequency of an allele or gene variant at a particular locus in a population. So let's go back to our example of the A and B alleles. And we'll just say for this example that the A allele is dominant to the B allele. So this would be like taking all the chromosomes in the whole population, laying them out, and then calculating the frequency of A alleles and the frequency of B alleles. And so P would be the frequency of A alleles, and let's just say that's like 60% or 0.6. And then Q would be the frequency of recessive alleles or B alleles in this case, and that would have to be 0.4 or 40%, because remember, P plus Q must equal 1, so 0.4 plus 0.6, that's 1. And that just has to do with the fact that these allele frequencies have to add up to 100% because they're the only two alleles in the population at that specific locus. 
I kind of want to hammer on the point that these allele frequencies, P and Q, don't really tell us anything about the population. So this is something that I didn't really understand when I was first learning this Hardy-Weinberg equation, is that these P and the Q don't really mean anything for the individuals, right? It doesn't tell us how many people in a population are homozygous dominant or have the AA genotype. It doesn't tell us how many people have the homozygous recessive or BB genotype. And it doesn't tell us how many people have the heterozygous genotype, which is AB, right? It only tells us how many of the A's are in the population and how many of the B's are in the population. Now, going back to the Hardy-Weinberg equation, this does help us calculate these frequencies of different genotyped individuals in a population. So as I said, the Hardy-Weinberg equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1. So each of these three terms describes the frequency of the different genotypes for a population. So P squared is the frequency of the dominant homozygous genotyped individuals. So these are going to be the AA individuals. Then the 2PQ corresponds to the frequency, that whole term 2PQ corresponds to the frequency of heterozygous genotyped individuals in the population. That's AB. And then the Q squared corresponds to the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals in a population. And again, that's BB individuals. And again, why do these have to equal one? Well, because we're talking about a whole population and we're talking about frequencies of that whole population. So all this has to add to essentially 100% or one. So to quickly summarize all that, the individual allele frequencies, P and Q, don't really tell us shit about a population. But these different terms in the Hardy-Weinberg equation, P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared, allow us to calculate the actual genotype frequencies in a whole population. And that tells us something about all the individuals in that population. And so you can use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to calculate a whole bunch of things in a population. And, you know, for instance, you could be given the percent or the frequency of individuals in a population that have some recessive trait. And then from there, you can calculate the allele frequencies, the P and the Q, and you can calculate the heterozygous frequency, you can calculate the homozygous dominant frequency, you can calculate basically all the parameters um, using this Hardy-Weinberg equation. So let's say, for example, that there is a single gene that encodes hair color. This is obviously not realistic, but just for an example, let's say that black hair is dominant to blonde hair. So blonde hair is recessive, black hair is dominant. Now that means that the brown allele is going to be P and the blonde allele is going to be Q. So let's say that you get a problem that tells you that 16% of a population has blonde hair and the rest of the population has black hair. And this kind of makes me think of Brave New World or some kind of utopian nightmare. But from here, you can actually calculate the allele frequency and genotype frequencies of this 1984 looking population. So what you know about this population already, given this information, is the Q squared, or the frequency of the homozygous recessive trait, which again is blonde hair. So from there, you can actually take the square root of this frequency to just get Q. And so it's going to be the square root of 0.16. It's fairly easy math. That's 0.4. So that means that 40% of the alleles in the population are this blonde allele. From there, it's pretty easy to calculate P. You just subtract 0.4 from 1, which is 0.6. So this means that the frequency of the black allele is going to be 60% or 0.6. And then from there, you can plug in your P and your Q into these other two terms that you have not solved for yet, which is going to be that homozygous dominant term and the heterozygous term. And from there, you can actually calculate the frequency of the two other genotypes, which is going to be the homozygous individual with black hair and the heterozygous individual with black hair. And that turns out to be 36% and 48% respectively. And so overall, the Hardy-Weinberg equation is very useful for calculating allele frequencies and also genotypes within a population. However, like a blind jockey in a hailstorm, it makes a whole lot of assumptions.
It essentially assumes a population is this static thing that never changes. And we know that that's just not true, right? Populations are changing constantly. And so that's the next thing I want to get into. I want to talk about how populations change and the genetic and evolutionary forces behind that change. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one -on -one admissions advising from Med School Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400, on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. In this next segment, I want to talk about how populations change. So there are four main ways that populations change over time. They are natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow. I'll start with the first and probably one you're most familiar with, and that is natural selection. So natural selection is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. The classic example of natural selection is the example of peppered moths during the Industrial Revolution in England. So during this time, factories in England burned coal, and this generated really thick, dark black smoke. And the soot from this smoke actually started to coat trees near the factories, turning them black. And one thing that was never mentioned when you learned this story was that this seems like a pretty big environmental hazard, <laughs> obviously, if you have all this smoke coating trees. But anyways, what happened over time was that the populations of these peppered moths, which were originally whitish in color, actually transformed into a more black color. And the reason was that essentially that black coat enabled them to avoid predation by blending in with their environment. And because this inferred such a higher likelihood of survival, then the moths that looked this way were able to reproduce and pass along their genes at a greater frequency. And therefore, the population transformed from one of light colored peppered moths to dark colored peppered moths. And fun fact, they are called peppered moths because they actually produce uh, the spice pepper. And so just to summarize all that, natural selection causes changes in populations by essentially selecting for traits that enable organisms to survive and reproduce more and therefore change the overall composition of that population towards that phenotype that causes the organism to survive and reproduce more. In the case of the peppered moths, the phenotype is that black color. Now, there's a couple terms you might see come up that have to do with natural selection and population genetics, one of which is the term fecundity. So fecundity is linked to natural selection. It refers to the physiological capabilities of both a male and a female to produce viable offspring, which to me that sounds quite a bit like fertility, but there's actually a difference between fertility and fecundity. Fertility refers to the actual or observed production of an offspring in an organism. On the other hand, fecundity refers to the theoretical ability of an organism to produce offspring. And I kind of like to think about it as one is able to be measured fairly easily, the other is not. So fertility is pretty easy to measure. That's just the number of offspring that a particular female has. However, fecundity is a lot more difficult to measure. You would need to measure how viable the sperm is, how viable the egg is, the capacity to undergo fertilization, etc. It's just a much more abstract concept. So again, fecundity is the 
theoretical ability of an organism to produce offspring, whereas fertility refers to the actual or observed production of offspring. Okay, so the last thing I want to say here about natural selection is that it tends to do one of three things to a population. It either stabilizes the population, disrupts it, or shifts it. Now, what do I mean by those three terms? Well, first, directional selection refers to a mode of natural selection in which a single phenotype is favored, causing the allele frequency to continuously shift in one direction. If you've ever seen a graph of frequency of individuals and of different phenotypes, it kind of looks like a bell curve. This essentially shifts the bell curve over towards a new phenotype. For example, let's just say that mice have a spectrum of colors from white all the way to black. And a directional selection then would be a selection force that changes the phenotype from like a gray mouse to a black mouse, right? You're just shifting the dominant phenotype in the population. So that's natural selection shifting a population. Disruptive selection or diversifying selection is a mode of natural selection in which extreme values or a trait are favored over its intermediate values. This results in a bimodal distribution on the graph that I was previously talking about. And if you don't know what a bimodal distribution is, it's essentially a graph that has like two humps or two maxima. Now, in terms of my mouse example, this would be like a selection force that selects for either the whitest of the mouse or the blackest of the mouse, and then nothing really in between. Last but not least is stabilizing selection. This is a type of natural selection in which genetic diversity decreases as the population stabilizes on a particular trait value. This is a graph that essentially gets more and more skinny of a bell curve. And if you don't know what graphs I'm talking about, just go Google types of natural selection and you can kind of see the changes in these graphs. I would say that's fairly important to know for the MCAT. In terms of mice, this would be like a single phenotype being selected for that is already the dominant phenotype in a population. So if a gray mouse, for instance, was the dominant phenotype, this is a selection force that increases the frequency of that gray phenotype. Okay, so let's move on now to the second force that changes populations, that is mutation. So mutations are random altercations in the nucleotide sequence of an organism's genome. There are two types of mutations that are important in population genetics. The first is recurrent mutations, and the second is non-recurrent mutations. Recurrent mutations are ones that occur repeatedly, generally at some characteristic frequency. In other words, these are mutations that recur over time and change some phenotype. So, for example, an article I read called The Part Played by Recurrent Mutation in Evolution by J.B.S. Haldeen talks about how the Y chromosome has decreased in size in mammals over time. You know, over thousands and thousands of years to us now, we have essentially tiny Y chromosomes compared to our ancestors. And this is linked to recurrent mutations or repeated mutations that lead to decreasing Y chromosome size. And so you might be wondering, okay, why is this? You know, why are there recurrent mutations? I thought mutations are random. And you're right, mutations are random, but also according to, to this article, there are some locations in the genome that are considered hotspots of mutation. And as you can probably guess, the second type of mutation I just mentioned earlier called non-recurrent mutations are mutations that arise only once in the history of a lineage. Now to kind of tie this into population genetics, Recurrent mutations are much, much more likely to cause changes in populations over time, right? When you have these non-recurrent mutations that only occur once, the chance that that allele kind of dies out with whatever organism it's in is much, much higher than these recurrent mutations that are constantly recurring at specific places in the genome. So all that is to say that recurrent mutations are more likely to lead to changes in population over time. Okay, so now for the most important thing about mutations, and that's that all they do is introduce new alleles into a population. They are not quite the same type of driving force for population change as, say, selection. All they're doing is introducing 
these new alleles that can then be acted upon by natural selection. So you can almost think about them as like the seeds being planted for change. An example of this that comes to my mind is something that I saw in my time as a researcher. So I participated in HIV research, and one of the studies we were looking at used what's called the broadly neutralizing antibody to try to eradicate the HIV virus before it could replicate, and essentially could be used as like a once a month treatment for somebody who has HIV. And in an animal study, what we recognized was that after this antibody was given to these monkeys, these macaques, we saw a huge change in the population of virus. So before we administered this antibody, we saw an HIV population of virus I'm talking about that was pretty homogeneous. And what we recognized then was after this antibody was administered, that this population changed. And what's most interesting is where that change occurred. So we recognized that at the specific site that encodes the proteins that are on the outside of the virus that are recognized by the antibody basically mutated. So it escaped this broadly neutralizing antibody by mutating. And how did it do that? Well, what probably happened was that one or two of these viruses, essentially very few in the population, due to random chance, were mutated at that exact site that essentially allowed the virus to escape that antibody. And so what happened when it was administered was that those few viruses that had the mutation were able to survive and reproduce unlike a majority of the virus in that population. And hence, the whole population changed to that mutated form of the virus. So I think this is a great example of how mutations essentially plant the seed that can then be population change. The next way that populations change that I want to talk about is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is changes in allele frequencies in a population due to random chance. And there are countless ways that this can occur, but in principle, this occurs when a population loses a random sample of its members. Two well-characterized ways that you have probably heard about are, one, population bottlenecks, and two, the founder effect. Population bottlenecks are an event that drastically reduces the size of a population. So this can be like natural disasters, hunting, habitat destruction, etc. The example that comes to mind here is the great zebra fires of 215 BC. Um, if you haven't heard of it, essentially what happened is that millions of years ago, a huge fire on the savanna killed a lot of multicolored zebras. You know, the, every single color you could think of, from red to blue to green, purple, they all lived on the savanna until this fire destroyed a lot of that population. And what happened is this left only a fraction of that population alive. In other words, there were only a fraction of the original alleles left in that population after the fire. And what that did is it changed the allele frequency of the population forever, right? That population will never look the same after that. Unless, of course, there is some recurrent mutation that brings back some of the colors, the population became a lot less colorful. And that is why zebras are now only black and white. Now, the founder effect, which is a type of bottleneck, occurs when a population is descended from a small number of colonizing ancestors. Let's go back to our zebras. So this would be essentially like 20 zebras leaving the greater population to go start their own zebra colony on an island somewhere. Like, you know, they just got tired of the other zebra shit and was like, we're out. And so what happens then is the genetic allele frequency of this founder population is going to be different than the overall population. And over time, this will lead to two distinct populations with different allele frequencies. Moreover, this founder population will have a reduced genetic diversity in comparison to the bigger overall population it came from. And this founder effect can also lead to a phenomena that is known as inbreeding. So this is when individuals with very similar genetic makeups mate and produce offspring that have lower fitness. And I'm not talking here about like physical fitness. I'm talking about reduced fertility, viability, and the predisposition for genetic disorders. Basically, the more genetically related two individuals are, the more likely they are to have the same alleles at a particular gene. And 
These alleles could be fully functional ones, but they could also be mutated ones that could lead to disease. So when these two related individuals breed, they're more likely than to give an offspring two alleles that are both recessive and bad and cause disease. Okay, so the fourth and final way that populations can change over time is through gene flow. And gene flow is the transfer of genetic variation or alleles from one population to another. Now let's go back to another historical zebra event called the Great Mating Frenzy of 57 BC. At this time, a population of striped zebras actually immigrated into the same area as a population of solid colored zebras. And what happened is that they mated and this population that immigrated in actually introduced an allele for stripedness to the solid colored population. And that is gene flow. Gene leakage is another term you may see and it's very related to gene flow. In fact, it's a type of gene flow. And this is the transfer of genetic information from one species to another. And so you'll recognize then that the difference between gene flow and gene leakage is gene flow is the transfer of genetic variation from a population to another population of the same species, whereas gene leakage is the transfer of genetic information between species. And one place where this comes up, and a good example, is in GMO crops. So GMO crops are genetically modified crops that are genetically modified for some desired phenotype, you know, whether that's survivability in the cold, susceptibility to a certain growth agent, whatever it is, they introduce a gene to help that plant grow better. And what they notice is that once they introduce that new gene into the plant, they see that some of the plants around that plant that are even different species will end up getting that gene as well. And so that is gene leakage, right? Because you're getting a gene that is in one species of plant that is going into another species. And by the way, plant biology isn't on the MCAT, so don't worry about that. I think this is just an interesting example of gene leakage. And hopefully what this has you kind of thinking about is hybrid organisms. So hybrids are organisms that are produced via the mating of two different species. For instance, like a lion and a tiger mate and produce a liger. A horse and a donkey mate to produce a mule. And you can guess where Shark Boy and Lava Girl came from. Now, it's well known that these hybrids are actually infertile, right? They can't produce children of their own. However, there is something interesting that sometimes when you produce hybrids, they have some improved or increased function in any biological quality in comparison to the parents that they came from. And this is called hybrid vigor. For example, you know, I've never asked myself the question, why are mules useful, right? Mules have been bred for a long time, and obviously they must be useful if people are breeding them, right? Because once they're bred, they can't produce more mules. Instead, you have to mate a horse and a donkey again, which I would assume is not an easy process. So what I didn't know, and according to The Guardian, their general health, strength, and longevity are all improved in comparison to horses and donkeys. And again, this is called hybrid vigor. And similar to the concept of hybrids, you may see another term come up on the MCAT called reproductive isolation. And reproductive isolation refers to different species that are unable to produce offspring together. And reproductive isolation can either occur prezygotically or postzygotically. Prezygotic reproductive isolation refers to the fact that reproductive isolation occurs before the zygote is even created. So this can be due to many different things. For example, and I don't mean to sound crude here, but mechanically speaking, the sex organs don't fit. So take a mouse and a horse, for example. Another way that this can happen is that the sperm of one species is unable to fertilize the egg of the other. Now, postzygotic reproductive isolation is reproductive isolation that occurs after the zygote is created. Hence, the sperm of one species was able to fertilize the egg of the other, but the zygote itself is either unable to develop into an organism, live as an organism, or reproduce themselves. Okay, so the very last thing I want to mention in this podcast comes from an article in Nature titled Natural Selection, Genetic Drift, 
and gene flow do not act in isolation in natural populations by Christine Andrews. As the title suggests, changes in population are a result of all of these different forces together. You know, that's natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. These are not acting in isolation. Instead, they're all working together to change the genetic makeup of populations. Thanks for listening to this episode of MCAT Basics. As always, if you like what we do, please leave us a review on iTunes. Tell your pre-med friends about us. Anyone who's studying for the MCAT, let them know that there is this free resource that is available for their use. Good luck as you continue to study for the MCAT and get ready to take it. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT or getting into med school, check out medschoolcoach.com for the experts.